Praise the Lord. We are recording this um, because we are on holidays. And I am so glad that y'all joined in for this. Afternoon Living Stones. Praise God. We're going to be looking in Acts 28. Um, Acts 28. 1 to 6. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that it is life for us. I pray that you would illuminate it to our spirit, man, Lord. And we would receive everything you want us to receive from it, Lord. You said in your word that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so, Lord, may great faith arise from hearing your word today. We trust you. We believe that every word in this book is the truth. So, Lord, just illuminate our spirit today with your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you're all doing well. Um, the tests, I'm going to get right into it, okay. Um, I'm not like Richard, <laughs> you know, have this long introductories. Well, maybe sometimes, but not all the time. So, we're going to read 28, 1-6. Now, this is Paul's uh, ministry at Malta. And we'll begin at verse 1. Now, when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta, and the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, and a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand, so when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. They said he was a god. Huh. So, at this point of scripture, Paul and the others had escaped the ship. They were shipwrecked. They were sailing to Rome. And they crashed on Malta, this little island. And the ship had about 20 or 276 people on it. There were soldiers, uh, Roman centurions there was the helmsman um and then there was paul the prisoner with all the others and the ship became stuck it it hit rocks and it it must have hit a pretty big rock the rocks of the island you know and was torn apart by the waves of the storm and all 276 men had to escape and swim to shore and they grabbed whatever they could to float on, right? Different objects and broken parts of the ship. But they all reached the shore. Remember Paul said, you know what? None of you are going to die. None of you. All of you are going to reach the shore safely. And um, they did. They, they reached the shore. And they noticed that the people of Malta were showing this unusual kindness towards them. It says the natives saw the the rain. They knew it was cold. They saw the shipwreck. They knew something terrible had happened. So they started a fire for them, you know, to keep them warm. And on the shore, and as the fire is going, Paul goes to add some more wood. And this viper comes out of nowhere, you know, and bites him. And the people said, oh, man, this guy must have done something real bad. For this, they took it as an omen, right? That he was a murderer or something like that. Or he is, he might have escaped the sea. The sea didn't get him, but this viper sure is going to get him. You know, but justice does not allow him to live, right? But Paul, he just, what does he do? Just shakes the stupid thing off. He shakes it off and he, it didn't even harm him. It didn't hurt him at all. They expected him to die. 
So as, as they just kept watching him and watching him, like at any moment, they just thought he was going to keel over and just die. But Paul didn't die. So then what? They thought that he was a god. They thought Paul was a god. These are the verses we're covering. These are going to be the verses we're covering of his voyage to Rome. But I also want to include some backstory to this, to why and how he gets here. How does he get here? He's sailing to Rome to appeal his case, you know, before Caesar. Because he was arrested back in Jerusalem, remember, in Acts 21. He was arrested because... Um, Jews of Asia, they stirred up the entire crowd in the temple, you know, making false allegations against Paul. They wanted him to be arrested. They didn't want him out there preaching the truth. So he gets arrested. And from that arrest, be before getting to this point of scripture, he faces the Roman guards. He's uh, faced a board of council members, you know, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he faced govern the governor of uh, Felix. And the governor of Felix sided with the Jews because he wanted to do them a favor. And he left Paul in prison for two years. And during that time, Felix tried to get money from Paul for, for early release, but Paul wouldn't be bribed. Then Felix was replaced by governor um, Festus. Then Paul faces Festus. Then soon after, he faces what? Her Her Herod Agrippa II. This was the son of Herod Agrippa I. And the one who killed James and arrested Peter, you know, back in Acts 12. And after facing Herod, Paul then sets sail to Rome. And through this storm and spending days on the water with, with others that thought they were going to die, but they made it to this point of this scene, the shipwreck at Malta. And that is just a summary of the backstory, right? Um, of why he was a prisoner, why he was, he ended up at Malta. How did he get to, from there to here, right? So this is everything he had to face so far and where, where he's going and how he got to this point. But the plan is to reach Rome. The plan is to reach Rome. That is um, his ultimate destination. So all these series of events is going on in Paul's life. Is God's will and plan for him. It was. It was God's plan for him. And if you read through the chapters of Acts, you notice that Throughout Paul's journeys um, and his, all his missions, he shares the testimony of Christ Jesus and he preaches the gospel. All continually, even through all the trials, the trials with the Jews and the Gentiles and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the council members and all, you know, all these people. But only because of his faith in Jesus. He was being led by the Holy Spirit. He endures. He endures the journey through all of this. And this, this gets me to my first point. Your faith, our faith is going to be tested just like Paul's was tested. And we read that Paul was arrested for his faith. He was stoned for his faith. He was jailed for his faith. He faced, many times he, he faced death. He, he was whipped and beaten and he spent, you know, all this time on the sea in this boat. He was probably in a lot of pain a lot of times. He was weary. He was hungry. He was thirsty. You know, everything that Satan could throw at him, you can imagine, was being thrown at him for his faith in Jesus. Because of his faith, he faced trial after trial after trial after trial and test after test. How many can put up your hand for that one, right? Uh-huh. 
But Paul continued through many of these things because of what? His faith. He gave up his life to the king of kings. He gave up his desires for his faith in Jesus Christ. So is our faith in Christ something that we're willing to suffer for? It's a good question. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3.12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So, we have to get to a place in our walk where our faith is bold, we're willing, we're unashamed of the gospel of Christ. So to go through trials and say, whatever comes my way, I will worship you, Jesus, and say, yes, I will continue to serve you, Jesus, no matter what. The storm or the trial is in my life. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to lay my life down. Living this Christian life, we're going to face many trials and things that will challenge us and test our faith. Amen? And a lot of us are going through that right now. But we have to remain faithful through the tests in this life. We all face, face trials in life. And we have our faith tested. It's 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 work, huh? You know we, we're tested with their kids. We're tested with temptations. We're tested in our mindsets and our thoughts, um, how we act. Whatever the case is, we all are being tested in this walk. But in the testing is where our faith grows, right? You know, and people get tested going through depression, loss of family, um, loss of friends, you know, and just loss of a job. Just so you can fill in the scenario there. You know, being abandoned, being, feeling alone. Think about it. Didn't we read about counting the cost as a Christian? It's in this book. It's in our Bibles. Well, my Bible's falling apart. <laughs> but um, it's in here. To be a follower of Jesus is counting the cost. We read in the Bible what Jesus spoke in Matthew. Matthew 16, 24. I think we should read that. Matthew 16, 24. And it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus is saying, If we desire to follow him, we must deny ourselves. That means we no longer belong to ourselves. We're his and his alone. We don't make the rules for ourselves anymore. You know, we don't. We don't take revenge. We don't... All this stuff, right? Our whole life belongs to Christ in everything. Everything belongs to Christ. Our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions. Even our emotions. Sometimes we try to justify our emotions and how we feel. You know? But we can't. In our decisions, our attitudes, our desires. You know, everything. And if we hold on to our life, if we hold on to the things that please us, um, our safety net, our comfort, our own will, we're going to lose our life. That's what the Bible says. He who, you know, holds their own life is going to lose it. But if we give up our life, we gain it. We must have a real tangible um, faith in action to walk this scripture out. Right? Let's look at James 2.20. James 2.20 says to us today,
But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? O foolish man, faith without works is dead. So Paul knew the mission. He counted his cost and he gave up his life to follow Christ, not knowing what he was going to face. He didn't know what the future was, but knowing it was going to lead him to eternity in heaven, right, to be with Jesus. And this is why he was so driven and determined to reach Rome, to stay in the will of God, keeping his faith regardless of what the test was that was coming his way. Hebrews 1, 11, 1 says, Faith um, is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So faith is our complete trust, confidence, and belief in God. And that produces the action in us. Even when we can't see a thing, even when we, we don't, we don't know what's there. We believe. We still believe. And this isn't a blind trust that I'm talking about in what we can't see. It is an unshakable trust in who we are in Christ and whose we are. Right? Through Paul's journeys, he went through stoning persecutions. He escaped uh shipwrecked, false accusations, arrests, jail, so much more. But Paul is not seeking his own will here of comfort and security to follow Jesus. He is following God's will. There is a difference. He was having faith to go against the grain, against the comfort, against um, safety, just to follow Jesus. He put his life aside and he knew that he could have died. But Jesus changed Paul's life just as he's changed our life. And that's why he's fighting. That's why he's pushing and pressing and pressing through every trial, counting it all joy because he knows the end result. He knows and remembers what he was saved from as well. And just as we all know what we were saved from, we know where the Lord took us from. You know that pit. So in Acts 9, 4, to 22. Let's just read that. Acts 9. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judah for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you, as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
so immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So, when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached, immediately he preached, the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem, and has come here for the, that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Wow. It, this tells the story of Paul, who used to be named Saul, on that road to Damascus. Tells us how Jesus knocked him off his horse with a blinding light from heaven. And he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Paul remembers this encounter with Jesus and why he holds on to his faith. He knows he is a changed man, a new creature in Christ Jesus, a new creation, and will one day see heaven just as we all will. We're all going to see heaven because of our faith in Christ, because of his faith in Christ. He knew he would see heaven. Paul knows he will be tested, but not defeated not defeated by the lies of the enemy, and neither will we not be defeated by what others say. Amen to that. And we're not going to be defeated by what we feel. We're not going to be defeated by what we think or any kind of physical attack. Paul knew that he would not be defeated. He would not by any attacks. His faith in Christ is the only thing that matters. Just like Paul, we should have this ingrained in our hearts and on our minds. That our faith in Jesus is everything, knowing that Jesus is with us always, wherever he sends us branches. And that's what I want to talk about next. God is with us. Although life gets really hard at times. And we go through these trials and we don't always understand. We don't. like, And a lot of times we find ourselves asking, Lord, what's going on? I don't understand. Well, you know, we, we deal with so many things that don't make sense. Things that hurt and make us feel uncomfortable and sometimes fearful. But we're to remain faithful. We are to remain faithful and know that God is with us. We must press in and continue to move forward into his will for our lives. Amen? We must keep our faith in Jesus and know that he has everything in control. He guides us through life and he protects us and he will always be with us no matter what. Amen? Amen. I'm going to pause it here for a minute. So, sorry about that. <laughs> Let's look at Deuteronomy 31, 8. Deuteronomy 31, 8. Let's read 7. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to your fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave nor forsake you. Do not fear, nor be dismayed. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you, nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Dismayed is 
break down, uh, be fearful, be threatened, or retreat, be discouraged. None of those things. Isaiah 41.10 says, and we'll look there. My dog wants my attention here. Isaiah 41.10 Fear not, for I am with you. Be not ashamed, be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Wow. Psalm 23, 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It says, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, life's going to get hard at times, but it doesn't matter what comes into our life. We can remain faithful to God because Jesus gives us the strength. He promises to be with us always, always. So let's read 28 of Acts. We're going all over the Bible today. Acts 28, again, and we're going to read 3 to 5, again. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand. They said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. Well, so, no doubt this man was a murderer, right? He's placing, placing wood on the fire. And something latches onto his hand. Yes, Paul is bitten by a snake. And yes, it hurts. Yes, it's a viper. And yes, the people, you know, of the island thought that he was going to die. So, I'm pretty sure they've seen this before, right? They've probably seen others being bit by a viper and, and belly up kind of thing, right? So, the people of Malta, they really thought it was justice being served to Paul. Because they assumed, they assumed he was a murderer since he was bitten by the snake. But no, Paul didn't die. God saved his life. You know, some could say um, others were there to treat him. You know, someone someone could say that. They could say, well, so yeah, someone was there and they, they, you know, cleansed the wound and whatever. And some could say, you know, Luke gave him medical treatment, saying that it wasn't a miracle. He just survived it. But no, it doesn't say that it was Luke or any kind of treatment. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that he, sh he, he shook off. It says that he shook off the viper from his hand. It doesn't say that he got it, any other treatment or anything. And he shook it off into the fire, and he did not suffer any harm. And that's because God was with him. So if we read Luke 10.39. Luke 10.39. What does that say? And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Is that right? Oh, nope. 1019. <laughs> That's a good verse, too. <laughs> Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So Jesus gives us protection from Satan for those who are doing his will and spreading the gospel. 
for us to use his name to cast out demons and to trample on serpents and scorpions. And it says that nothing by any means will harm us. You know, Satan's plan was to kill Paul, to prevent him from going to Rome, to finish his course. But God was with Paul and he shook the viper off his hand. And the Lord kept him. And he made a way through every scenario for Paul to stay in the will of God, being led by the Holy Spirit in faith. And for us, regardless of the troubles, regardless of the circumstances, what people say to us, uh, what people are saying against us, regardless of what attacks we're receiving from the enemy right now, God is with us. He will be with us continually. He never forsakes or leaves us. Joshua 1 9 says, I have, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's his word. So if, if maybe you lose a job, maybe you lose your home, you lose your vehicle, you you lose someone in your family, like a friend or a child or whatever it is, a brother, a sister, God is with you. So we need to take courage in following after Jesus and remain faithful to him and be bold to know that he is there. I am not ashamed of my faith. I'm not ashamed of my faith at work. I'm not ashamed of my faith out in the supermarket. I'm not ashamed of my faith when I'm walking down the street. When wherever I go, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed of my faith. If you're a young person today, you're not ashamed of your faith in front of your friends, at school, wherever you are. And Peel loves the Lord. Tenderheart loves the Lord and shares her faith because God is with me. God is with each and every one of you. Amen. And God protects us. You know, back to this shipwreck. Before escaping and swimming to shore, the soldiers made a plan to kill every prisoner on board, including Paul. So you can imagine what he was thinking, right? Because they didn't want him to escape their sentence. So it says in Acts 27, and I'm going to get in there, Acts 27, 42, and the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape, but the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. The soldiers couldn't let anyone escape. The responsibility um, was on the soldiers. You know, it was, and it was their job to make sure that each and every one ended up where they were going, you know. Instead of risking their escape, they would have just put them to death. That was their, their solution. But God's plan was different. God still had a plan and a purpose for Paul, and the Lord kept him alive. He protected Paul, and he already knew this time would come. He knew. He was there when Paul needed him. God will protect you as well. Second Thessalonians 3 verse 3 says, But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. He will. Let's look up Deuteronomy 31.6. And it says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, 
nor be uh, afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. That's such a famous passage that we love to quote. And we stand on it in faith. You know, the Lord fights for us. He will fight for us. He will protect us and he will take care of us. He will take care of you. Whatever you're going through right now. We, but we have to put our faith in trust in Jesus alone. And believe that God has our lives in his hands. When we're in his will, we have to be in his will. A lot of times we like to quote these scriptures, but if we're not in his will. I remember when when the Lord was talking about the sparrows, you know, were sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground that he doesn't know about, you know, and he counts all the hairs in our head. He knows all the hairs. They're all numbered. Some have less than others. I won't mention any names. <laughs> Where's my partner? No. <laughs> Only God decides when it's our time to go. Only God decides. We don't have to sit back and assume and, and decide, well, our time's coming short, our time's coming, our time's coming. No. Only God knows our time to go. We have to trust that God will see us through and protect us to wherever we're going, wherever he's bringing us. God has a purpose for each and every one of us, a special reason we're here on this earth. He's brought us this far. He's called us and he's protecting us to do the, his work, to do the work he's called us to do. I don't believe Paul wanted to escape all of this. He, had, he, he could have escaped at any time on this journey if he wanted to. But he remained faithful to the Lord, to the call on his life. He was committed to finishing the race, to finish the course that he was on, irregardless of what it meant for his life. Amen? 2 Corinthians 4, 8-9. to nine. Oh, my dog. Sorry about that. I just put him out again. Um... 2 Corinthians uh, 3, or no, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. There's going to be trials. There is going to be trials, and a lot of us are in trials now. But we're to remain faithful to God. Paul was facing death, but the Lord said, No, it's not my will. It's not your time. My will and my purpose is going to be fulfilled in your life, Paul. You are going to live. And so... We must also do the same thing. Trust the Lord. While we're still alive, right, on this earth, we have to, to put our hands, our, our lives in God's hands. And just, he has a work for us to do. As long as we're still breathing on this earth, we have work to do. And you know what? God's going to protect us. Our faith is going to become strong enough to face the trials of life and not waver. And we're not going to be tossed to and fro. And we're not going to have doubts and unbeliefs. And, you know, and we're not going to waver. God is the one who protects us. He fights for us. He gives us the ultimate strength that we need to continue on. It's in his strength, in our weakness, he is made strong, right, in us. And, and it's, I find it very interesting that in the moment the soldiers want to kill, all the prisoners, God used one, one of their own, a Roman centurion, to save Paul. That was the Lord. The Lord moved this centurion's heart to say, no, 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 no. We're not going to kill anyone here. Not today. Not on my watch. We're just going to let them go overboard and they're going to swim and they're going to make it to shore. So by God using this Roman centurion, Paul's life was saved. 
by God working through this one man, Paul, and every other prisoner was saved. Their life was spared. If every prisoner would have died in that moment, the soldiers could have called it justice. Right? That would have been justice for the crimes the prisoners committed of murder, theft, rape, fraud, anything, you name it. They would have all died if God was not protecting Paul. So, because God protects us, who else is he keeping alive? Right? In our life. It's the same for us. You know, we all deserve death from God and the wrath of God to burn in hell because of our sins that separated us from God because he's a holy God he cannot abide sin in his presence we deserved hell branches but just as God saved Paul and the other prisoners by using one man the centurion God, what did he do? In his grace and his love and his mercy, he sent Jesus. He, by using one man to save, he sent his son Jesus to save every man, woman, and child, every single one of us, by dying on the cross for our sins. To reconcile us back to him. He provided salvation for the whole world. So that we would respond to him and repent from our sins. So as much as an example as Paul is to us Christians, Paul didn't do any of these things on his own. He only did these things by the power of the Holy Spirit and so must we. The power of the Holy Spirit that lived in him, in his submission to Jesus. Now, I know all of us here are Christians today, and we all have the power of the Holy Spirit. It's available to each and every one of us. The Spirit of Christ lives in each and every one of us, who causes us to endure the trials that we're facing. All of us have to ask, Lord God, give us your comfort. Give us your help. Give us your strength. We just have to ask. We, we just repent and ask him to fill us. If there's anything in our lives, any unbelief, any doubts, any fears, you know what? And if you're not a Christian, I would invite you today to give your heart to the Lord, to surrender. God is calling so many back today. We, we, before we met Christ and we were washed in, by the blood and we received him, we, we were dead in our sin. And it's the same with you as an unbeliever. If you are dead in your sin, and you are if you don't have Christ, I'm inviting you today to cast that sin and that burden and that darkness on the Lord and just receive him as your Lord today. Just say, Lord, I believe in you. Come and cleanse me. I repent of my sin. And just make him Lord. Well, I thank you for listening today and joining in. We just want to praise God for his goodness. We praise God for his great salvation. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who joined in today and for those who are joining in later, Lord God, those who may come across the channel. We ask you, Lord God, to continue to keep us in your grace, to strengthen us. We bless your name, Lord. Bless your holy name, Lord God. <sighs> Increase the faith in us, Lord, as we study your word, as we we look to you, Lord. Give us great measure of faith. Lord, we count on your righteousness because we know that our righteousness is as filthy rags. Oh, Father, we're so grateful for salvation today. We're so grateful for these 
stories in your word, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. They're meant to strengthen us and to correct us and build us up in our faith, to point us to Christ, to show us who you are, Lord, and how loving you are, but also to show us, Lord God, that you are a holy and righteous and just God. So thank you, Lord. Continue to work in each heart and draw us near to you, Lord. Amen. In your name I pray. And help us through our trials, Lord. How to trust you. Hmm. Well, I love you and uh, you have a blessed day. And when we get back, um, we'll continue with our series on in Isaiah. God bless you all. We love you.